All right, folks, let's dive in today. I am joined today by a man who needs no introduction. Some people say that, but this is actually true. I'm joined by Seth Godin. Thanks for being here today, Seth. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. It's great to see you. Yeah, likewise. I've got to say, I've got to tell you just right at the very beginning how much I appreciate uh, your, you may not know this, you, you talk in the book actually about useful imposters and you gave me permission a couple of years ago to be a useful imposter. You mentioned how you should write a blog post every day in one of your other books. And I literally Googled how to start a blog. And then I started a blog because of you. So yeah. I don't know if you want to say anything about useful imposters. I find it to be a very, very helpful uh, encouragement to those of us just f finding our voice. Well, I'm glad that worked. Um, you know, imposter syndrome is an epidemic. It's that feeling, it afflicts just about all of us of showing up and feeling like you don't have a permit or authority or expertise. And the thing is, if you're doing generous work and leading, well, then of course you're an imposter because no one's ever done that before. Mm. If you're doing something again and again, that's different. So to be a useful imposter is someone who seeks the additive, who seeks to make something better, but isn't sure. And so this is the opposite of... Uh, fraud, the opposite of being a hustler. You're not doing it for you. You're doing it for the other person. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. No. And to, to have that permission, because you can think, well, what, what can I add to the conversation or what can I add? And just giving that language was phenomenally helpful to me, but we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about your book, which is awesome. Song of significance. I took more notes than we could possibly cover <laughs> in 45 minutes. So I hope you blocked three hours. Does that work? Uh, I wanted to dive into, there's a particular quote. You mentioned Satya Nadella has this phrase, productivity paranoia. Would you tell us a little bit about that phrase and why it's meaningful to you? So 110 years ago, Frederick Taylor wrote a short book about the way to make factories more efficient. And it involves using a stopwatch. It involves treating people like a resource, not a human. If they're a machine, you want the machine to go faster. If you time every move, if you jerk them around, that's where the phrase came from, like uh, puppets, you can make your output go up. Hmm. And that has been the watchword of most industrialism ever since. Well, if you are doing programming, we don't need a stopwatch. All we need to do is look how many lines of code you write. And if you say good programmers write a lot of code, that's what you're going to get, a lot of code. You're not going to get good code, important code, useful code, you can get a lot of code. Mm. And so product, productivity paranoia is the idea that a lot of tech companies and non-tech companies have, which is let's measure whatever is easy to measure and make that number go up. Yeah. And what the Microsoft team was trying to say is let's figure out what's important and focus on that instead. And which begs the question, what is important and how did they or how have you seen organizations focus on that instead? So if you've ever called a call center, you will see that they think what's important is how many calls per hour an agent can handle. And mm -hmm. if you're a particularly difficult uh, case, they'll just hang up on you because it'll make their numbers go up. On the other hand, Tony Shea, who's, all, who's missed by so many, at Zappos said, we are going to celebrate people who spend the most time on a call. And I believe the record is nine hours. Wow. And no way. No one, yes. No one got in trouble for spending 20 minutes on a call, even though it was a $100 pair of shoes. Hmm. You say, well, how does that make sense? And Tony says, look, we're a shoe store. We sell what everybody else sells. So what we really sell is trust and connection and the benefit of the doubt and belief. Hmm. If someone has a problem and in 20 minutes I can solve it, that is productivity. If it's yeah. a 20-minute problem and I only give that person three minutes, I just lost the customer. That was a $5,000 mistake. So how, so I love the example of Zappos. That's great. How does an organization, it's, you, you just kind of eloquently rush past Tony's identification of the thing they're actually selling. How does an organization identify the thing that they actually need to be optimizing for? Okay. So first you got to make a choice. Either the motto of your organization is you can pick anyone and I'm anyone. And that, for example, is most screenwriters when they're not on strike, because Hollywood's got a lot of choices. Just take whoever you know, your cousin right. or whatever. Right. Or 
You'll pay a lot, but you get more than you pay for. Hmm. Those are the only two choices. And in the category of you'll pay a lot, but you get more than you pay for, you have great clients. You have important work. You have reputation. So what makes that happen? So let's think about uh, Thomas Derry's car wash. He has uh, more than one now, I think two or three. And it costs time and money compared to other lesser car washes to get your car washed at Rising Tide Car Wash. Does your car come out cleaner? I have no idea. There's no scientific data on this. Do you feel better when you drive away? Yes. Right. Why? Because everyone who works there is treated like a person and everyone and many of the people who work there are uh, neurologically diverse and are challenged by some disabilities. You leave probably tipping more, feeling better about the entire environment. That is what they sell. So he shouldn't be spending a lot of time picking out a better wax. He should be spending time figuring out how to make his employees comfortable enough to do good work. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love that story in the book. One of the things that I can't help but wonder about is with going back to productivity paranoia for a second is there's an organizational level and you and I have been talking right now about the organizational level, but I find even if you strip away the organ, you know, we can, we can kind of blame organizations for a lot of stuff. I find even as of the organization, it's a deeply personal issue as well. Can you speak to how an individual overcomes productivity paranoia as well? Well, the first thing I'd say is we're looking for a mutual commitment. You're not going to find a job where the boss gives you significance. You might find a job where you can take significance in a dance with the boss, where you make a commitment to each other. And what I wrote about in Lynchpin is the idea that the individual has a lot of agency in this respect. And what I wrote about in the practice is overcoming Pressfield's resistance and measuring the right things. So what does Mark Zuckerberg want you to measure? He wants you to measure how many angry comments you have, who's talking about you behind your back, how many people called friends are on the thing, what your numbers are, right. none of which are actually important to your life. Right. You are Fan doing it because we're, our instinct is to keep track of our neighbors. Our instinct mm. is to exceed some metric. And if you can pay attention personally to what you're trying to do. So you know, in my case, there are authors I respect who have sold 40 times as many books as me. And it's fine. It's great. But what I would need to do to sell that many books isn't what I'm measuring. So I'm not going to try to write a book or promote a book that does that. And I think sometimes my publisher wishes I would, but that's okay with me. Hmm. I have a different agenda about what I'm trying to do. And that's what I measure. And how do you define that agenda or how would going back to it, it, advising an individual relative to an organization? Because it strikes me. And I like that phrase. You mentioned it, mutual commitments of significance. It's a, it's a two way street, right? It's not like it's the organization's job or it's my job. There is that mutual commitment. Yeah. How does an individual, I mean, now with, you know, employees having more agency or ability to choose than ever before, how do they start to define for themselves their half of the significance equation? It's super simple and really hard. You have to answer two questions. What is the change I seek to make and who am I trying to change? That's it. So if lots of people are going to see your new line of skateboards or, your, or the movie you're writing, it's not for all of them. It can't be for all of them. Which ones is it for? What do they believe? What do they want? What do they dream of? What are they afraid of? And then yeah. what is the change you seek to make. And if you can be clear about those two things, you will find the metrics and you will find a way to talk to yourself about whether you're achieving what you seek. It strikes me, you know, part of my role at Stanford is advising entrepreneurs. And one of the phrases that we use in kind of the entrepreneurial world is, is your product a vitamin or is it a painkiller? If it's just a vitamin, people are going to forget it, right? I don't, I forget to take my Flintstones, right? But if it's a painkiller, people are going to remember. And one of the challenges I would say for an entrepreneur that I've observed is finding the person for whom your thing is a painkiller. Can you talk at all about, because it's the way you phrase that, it makes it seem like it's an a priori decision that you're going to decide ahead of time who it's for. But I know that it's not quite that simple. So how do you, how does one go about discovering the audience or the, the people for whom they desire to make a change? This is such a great analogy. Let me take it apart a little bit if I could. And I, I apologize if it's your analogy. Um, 
if you don't have enough vitamin C, you're going to get scurvy and die. Right. And if you take too much fentanyl or even a little, you're going to die. Mm. So what we're really talking about mm -hmm. is would you be missed if you were gone? And it is possible to create value in the world that doesn't simply relieve pain, but elevates people in a way that they would go out of their way to engage with you. And placebos and vitamins in North America are placebos because I have never met someone with scurvy, um, <laughs> have a useful purpose if you don't focus all your uh, energy on vitamin C palmitate or whatever that is, but on mm. the story that goes with it. So I think what uh, thoughtful entrepreneurs do is, yes, a priori, they announce who are the people they're trying to serve, not by name or by gender or by race, right. but by what they believe, what they right. seek, what they want. So if I'm going to come out with a $9,000 baby stroller, it's not just who has enough money to buy a $9,000 baby stroller. It's who desires the status and possible peace of mind that comes from having the most expensive baby stroller in the world. I'm not going to hide from that. Those are the people I'm looking for. And if you come to me and say, do you have any $200 baby strollers? I won't talk you out of buying a $200 baby stroller. I will give you the phone number and address of the $200 baby stroller store because huh. I want you to buy it from them, not from me. Yeah. Because yeah. you don't want what I'm selling. And the second thing, since you brought up the word entrepreneur, when I was at the business school, uh, the distinction wasn't made. And the distinction is rarely made between freelancer and entrepreneur. Many people who call themselves entrepreneurs are not entrepreneurs. They are freelancers. I am a freelancer. You mm -hmm. cannot buy stock in my company. I'm not building something that I can sell and someone else can make bigger. I don't make money when I sleep. I do the work myself. I have no staff. I'm a freelancer and proud of it. If you want to be successful as a freelancer, you need to get better clients. If you want to be successful as an entrepreneur, you need to build a system bigger than yourself. Right. And there's a lot of pain and confusion that comes from people who don't understand the difference. Hmm. You you discover it one way or the other, I suppose. If you if you build in what reflection cycles, that's the right. key. I've I've done both and. Hmm. I've been successful as an entrepreneur, but I never enjoyed it as much as I like being a freelancer. Hmm. Do you, how, how do you resist, maybe just going on a tangent, you can cut it off if you're not interested in it. How do you resist? Because I'm sure there's lots of people going, you should scale this. You, you know, there's no lack of noises, I'm sure, in your life telling you that. You, imagine if it were bigger. How do you check those? How do, how do yeah. you silence those influences? Um, so the quick history lesson is I invented email marketing. And then later I built one of the first social media networks and um, pioneered a different way of doing online learning. And in all three cases, it has gone on to become something so much bigger than what I started. And I don't own any of it, hmm. right? This email marketing is now a $30 billion a year business. I had it when it was a $0 billion a year business. And then oh. I just said, go, go for it. It's fine. Now I can go do something else. Hmm. And the goal is not to collect as many assets as possible. The goal is to turn on lights, create systems, and then get out of the way. Mm. That's beautiful. All right. I want to talk about this. This is a nice transition, actually. One of the things you said in the book is uh, finding the path, I'm quoting, finding the path is largely the work of finding non-paths until the path is evident. You want to say anything about that? I've got a follow-up question, but do you want to clarify that yeah, or expand? So let, let's that? talk about uh, one of Stanford's biggest exports, which is Google. Uh, it is said that two people founded Google, but the fact is Google was failing. It was failing for two reasons. One, because there wasn't enough computing power available to them to do the searches they said they were going to do. And two engineers, not named Larry and Sergey, figured out how to solve that problem. And the second problem they had is Yahoo, where I was working at the time, was the internet. We own the whole thing. And a woman named Marissa Mayer said to her bosses, there's only going to be two links on the homepage. At the time, Yahoo had 183 links on the homepage. Wow. Wow. So think about what it took for Marissa, whom, I don't know, 25, 30 years old, stand up and say, nope, 
two links. That's all. Hmm. That built Google. Because what we know is in 1998-99, if you took the Google results, the Yahoo results, and switched the logos, people preferred and said the Google results were better, even though they were Yahoo results. Because Google's hmm. brand wasn't built by its search index. It was built by those two links on the homepage. Okay. Right? So what I'm getting at is Sergey and Larry deserve credit for launching the thing, but how many people did it take before it became Google? And the answer is a lot. So you had to do all these other things that didn't work until you found something that did work. And yeah. when you're doing the things that work, most people don't like them, don't approve of them, don't cheer you on. So when I was at Yahoo, we had the chance to buy Google for $10 million. And the Yahoo guys were like, that's stupid. There's only two links on the homepage. We already have a search engine. Go right. away. Right. So, so it strikes me that this works for organizations that are obscure, right? Google is kind of nothing at the time where for whom you could say non-paths are a non-issue. What about the organizations for whom non-paths are a deal breaker? Meaning it's, it's easy for, for a small company to, to, to find its path by way of non-paths. What I hear from a lot of organizations, though, is our brand is too important or, or some version of that. What do, you, what do you say to folks for that whom? One's a, that one's a layup. First okay, of all, go ahead. Then, then, the, then, then uh, I'll alley-oop you. Here you go. The list of products that have been canceled by Microsoft and Apple is more than 350 long. Mm -hmm. If you go to Starbucks and ask for a VIA portable powdered coffee to go, they can't hand it to you. If you ask them for the Hear Music uh, CD collection, they don't have it anymore. Oh, but, I remember those, those were great. <laughs> I mean, there was a time when the number one seller of CDs in America was called Starbucks. Wow. More than real. any record store, they sold that many records. So. I can go down a long list of any company that matters. Nintendo used to make playing cards right. that you can go down the list and say, the companies that say their brand is too valuable to risk are gone mm. every time. And, you know, if I think about my friends in the publishing industry, Simon Schuster, Random House, they're going to be gone really soon. The fact is 25 years ago, they could have started Google. You only needed two people. Right. And they didn't, because instead of saying we're in the business of organizing the world's information, they said we're in the business of chopping down trees and making independent bookstores happy. Yeah. They lost. Yeah. So then what do you do? It, say, let's take Simon and Schuster. They come to you and they say, Seth, we want to we want to find the path by finding non paths. Are there mechanisms or structures that you, because when it's two folks in a garage, right, it's you kind of, you're non-path finding all the time. How do they create the right space or systems to do non-path elimination? Okay. So there are two interesting things that I would talk about companies needing to overcome for the innovator's dilemma. The first one happened to me at Yahoo. As I said, when I was there, Yahoo was everything. And I went to Jerry Yang, who was, the co-founder, and I said, Jerry, you're busy buying companies for five, six billion dollars at a time. Why don't you just let me take a 80% pay cut and two people, and we'll go across the street, and we will bring you companies that you already own that you don't have to acquire, that once you plug Yahoo into them, will work. And he looked at me, and I, it's like it was yesterday. He looked at me and said, I would love to do that, but then everyone would want that job which is one of the stupidest reasons I can imagine. For <laughs> he wants that one back. I think he wants that one back. <laughs> and so the first one is you got to figure out where the skunk works is, as the great Tom Peters would, has written about so eloquently. If you peek in on them too soon, your desire to match the way you deal with every other tiny innovation will kick in and you will kill it. And in, um, in the great uh, project management book, uh, that Microsoft Press has, its name just escaped me, the idea of version 3.0 kicks in. Version yeah. 1 and version 2 at a company like Microsoft, you can do without Steve Ballmer looking at them. And only after it succeeds does the lawyer and the CEO kick in, and that's when right. they wreck it. Right. So, But you got to do a couple versions where nobody's watching. Hmm. The second thing, what are the assets that Simon & Schuster owns besides its backlist? The assets it mostly owns is 
a sales force, and a relationship with independent bookstores. If you are going to use those two assets to get to the next place, the only thing you're going to build is something that those two assets smile at. And that's what killed them, what killed all the book publishing people. They have always viewed innovation as a threat because they've tried to protect the independent bookstore. The independent bookstore doesn't know what to do with audiobooks. They don't know what to do with CD-ROMs. They don't know what to do with casual online games. They don't know. You go down the list because every single time they're like, wait, our customers won't like this. Right. So right. you've got to decide if you're going to explore paths, which customers are you trying to change and mm -hmm. who's it for? Mm -hmm. And I've been thrown out of some of the best publishers in New York City with this rant. So one of the examples, just if it's, if it's worth it by way of a gift to you that I love to use is uh, Jerry Seinfeld. You know, it's like 10 or 20 million people think he's a genius on Letterman, but the cost of thinking, you know, the, the cost of getting to that point is bombing at nightclub after nightclub after nightclub. It's like, and there's hundreds of people who think he's a moron. Right. And I, I to, to your point about skunk works, perhaps where what places need are the small kind of nightclubs where they can look like a moron to a few people to get to the point where they've got a set for Letterman or something like that. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to switch gears a little bit and um, talk about the Carbon Almanac. I'm going to tell folks who aren't familiar with the project, just generally what the, what the achievement was with the Carbon Almanac to begin with. So, um, I wrote my first blog post about the climate crisis more than a dozen years ago. It didn't solve the problem. And I realized that I wasn't talking about it very much. And then I realized the reason is because I had been indoctrinated and pushed to feel incompetent and like a hypocrite. And I thought, if I feel this way, I bet other people do too. I used to make almanacs for a living, so I know how to make an almanac. And I went to my publisher and said, I'm going to do this as a volunteer with other volunteers. And they said, yeah, if you do that, we will pay you a small advance and you can go make it. So then I recruited 300 people, most of whom I had never met in 90 countries, 40 countries, sorry, 40 countries. And we came together online. We never once had an all group meeting. We worked asynchronously as time zones around the clock. Okay. And Wait, we, how did you get these people, by the way? This I just wrote a PS on a blog post and then invited the people who came to invite some other people. Mm, okay, okay. And um, nobody got paid. The next five months, we invented, wrote, designed, edited, fact-checked, researched, typeset, and delivered a 97,000-word almanac without one significant error. It has won awards. It has been published in many languages around the world. And it is a foundational text for how we can think as normal non-scientist humans about what is happening to our climate. Wow. Well, and, I mean, congratulations. That's an incredible accomplishment, by the way. It's incredible. You. Thank you. It was over a year of my life as a full time volunteer, um, and it was worth every moment of it. I learned it's, so much. I met some really cool people. So, just talking about that phrase, full time volunteer, you're basically shoulder to shoulder with 300 perfect strangers. Any, anything you realized about marshalling uh, a cause that you hadn't known before from that project? Oh, so many things. And that's what the Song of Significance touches on. That book wouldn't exist without it. Mm. A couple of the things we came up with is this. Enrollment is critical. Every single person listening to this podcast probably needs to work. But you don't have to work where you work now. Mm. Going where you work now is a voluntary choice. If we aren't enrolled in the journey, if we're just phoning it in, then we are begging to be managed. But if you want leadership to happen, people have to want to be there, which leads to turnover is a good thing. Mm. Some people came, stayed an hour and left. And we were like, thank you. Thanks for trying. <laughs> Not, right? Right. We need that. Yeah. Other people stayed, sprinted for a month and then said, I got to go. We're like, thank you. And mm. other people stayed the whole time. It's mm. up to them. Now we're up to 1900 people in 90 countries because new people came along and joined in. Wow. So that's enrollment. And then the third one, is what do you do about the lack of expertise? Because nobody, including me, knew how to do any single page of the almanac from soup to nuts. Couldn't be done. Wow. But we knew that they, the page had to exist. So how are we mm -hmm. going to get there? And so we coined page 19 thinking. Yeah, I was hoping you'd touch on that. So, so tell us more about page 19 thinking. What, so what it's going to be a page 19, but you're holding back because you're not the expert. We're like, okay, can you give us 
one line about what page 19 should be about. Mm. Hand it to us. And then someone else can say, wait, I'm going to do a little research and come back with a paragraph. And then someone else is going to take that paragraph and make it into a page. And someone else is going to take that page and add a graph. And someone else is going to improve it. And we relentlessly criticize mm. the work. At mm. every moment, the work is criticized. We never criticize the worker. Yeah. Because the work is our form of taking away the marble bits until da David is standing there in the sculpture, right? right? Right. Who is holding the chisel doesn't matter. That's why mm. the names aren't on every article. They insisted they put my name on the cover, but I didn't even want that because it's mm. not our work. It's just true. Yeah. And wow. so when we think about who's it for, what's it for, what's the change we seek to make, how does an enrolled community come together with a leader to do something that might not work? The answer is one step at a time. Yeah. If you're waiting for me to show you the finished product, you will wait too long. Look at the early pages of Yahoo. Look at the early pages of Amazon. Look at the early pages of any website on the internet. It wasn't done. So when was it good enough for you to join the team? Hmm. And the answer is joining the team becomes part of the process. Hmm. Do the reading, show your work. I, uh, I love the question that you asked. I don't know if you remember in the book. I don't want to quiz you on your own. But you, you said something to the effect of, here's what I made. Can you make it better? Is that it? I think that that please make it better. Not can you, it's not. Yeah. Please make it better. I love that. I love that. I don't know and if you've heard the, go it ahead. goes against our instincts to say that. Mm. And I know how I feel. There are a few people um, like the great Nikki Papadopoulos who I can send a book to and she will make it better. Mm. But most people who are amateurs can't. And so I won't show it to them because it'll just screw up the work and my head. And one thing that I do is I send the book to a professional copy editor before I submit it. So that way, the person who's good at editing doesn't have to get hung up on serial commas and that stupid Oxford comma and everything because it's mm. all perfect, mm. right? I know it's wasted because I have to do it again, but it's finding that person who gets where you are trying to go. Like, so if you pull over on the side of the road and say, right before GPS, can you please tell me how to get to... Domino's Pizza, they don't say you shouldn't go there, go this place instead. You want someone to give you directions to go where you are going. So yeah. the key for the almanac and just about everything else is please start by telling us where you're seeking to go. Don't mm. build a 250 page almanac until you have two pages that you're really proud of. Yeah. It needs to rhyme with this. If it doesn't mm. rhyme with this, we're going to make it better. But we're not going to argue about this after we've approved these two pages. This is the point. Hmm. That's, you're reminding me right now of a story. My business school days, we went to uh, Slovenia for a study trip while we were in business school. This is pre iPhone, pre GPS or, you know, widely available GPS. And uh, we had driven into Italy for dinner and then we didn't know how to get back to Slovenia. <laughs> and so we'd stop every hundred yards and say, excuse me. And somebody would look, we'd say, Slovenska. And they'd point, we'd say, grazie. We get back in our car, drive, you know, 200 yards. Excuse me, Slovenska. Grazie. You know, and we got all the way back that way, right? But that's it. That's our way of saying, please make it better. Oh, it's too good. I hadn't thought about that in a long time. That's hysterical. Okay. So I, one thing I want to talk about, I love the story of Harry Acker at Sleepy's. Would you tell us the Harry Acker story? All right. So in this era of Casper and all the other online things, most people don't go to mattress stores anymore. A mattress store is a sad place. It's a bunch of empty beds and two lonely salespeople. It's true. So we're at the mattress store and the phone rings and you can just feel the stress in the air. There's, Ooh, and the guy like reaches over and picks it up and he says, yes, sir. Turns out there were 90 sleepies at the time and Harry Acker was Mr. Sleepy. He owned it. He was, I don't know, 80 years old. And all he did all day was call each store. Hmm. And when you picked up the phone, all he said was, what's wrong? And if you couldn't answer the question with something that was wrong, you were in trouble. And then he got it fixed. Mm. And so he got 80 bits of feedback every single day about something to make better. And then he got it fixed. That's so good. I know I, I, you hear this adage, right? Uh, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. What do, you think of, what do you think of that archetypical leader, the don't bring me problems, bring me solutions leader? First, that person might be a manager, not a leader. Um, second, 
awareness of the market belongs to the zone of market capitalism, which is if I can solve the market's problems, I can grow. This doesn't belong to industrial capitalism. So after Henry Ford figured out the Model T, the next 20 years of Ford was not what does the market want. It's what can we make cheaply next that will cause our competitors to fall behind. How do we get our, the people out in the world to become the engine of our industry? Not how do we solve right. a problem in the world? Right. And so if you need to be aware of the market, you need the problems. Mm -hmm. You need a team of people to think about solutions. But if you're saying to someone, do not bring me any problems unless you can also tell me how with all these constraints we can solve it, then you're in bad shape. And if you think about Apple, which I think is at some level the apotheosis of uh, what happens when you stop listening to your customers, there's no solution to the problems that people are saying. So if someone shows up and says, this iPhone won't let me do X, Y, or Z because the costs of the store are too big, mm. there's no solution for that. If someone says, you haven't updated Keynote in seven years, there's no solution for that, right? Right. And so people aren't surfacing the problems. So mm. the, the very successful executives can pretend that this luxury good with no defects, when in fact, it's riddled with defects, creating all sorts of opportunities for the people who are going to replace them. Mm. You know, the great Bob McKim, who's one of the progenitors of the, of the design program at Stanford, he gave a very simple assignment I thought of when you told the, um, the sleepy story. It's keep a bug list. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's just a list of things that bug you. Not, line, not errors in computer code. This is before computer programming entered common parlance. It's just write down the stuff that bothers you. If you attend to your annoyances, you're, you're likely to identify solutions. Yeah, love that. And if you can open source the list, it's even better. Mm. So going back for a second, speaking of that, going back to the Carbon Almanac, because you mentioned you wouldn't just trust your manuscript in the hands of anybody, right? Nikki, few others. How did you solve that problem? The, the please help me make it better problem, which ostensibly can't be solved by everyone. How did you open source that? Well, because it wasn't my manuscript. It was our manuscript. We had a, we had a standard. The standard was clear. If you can rewrite this sentence so that the other people who are standing next to you think, yeah, that sentence is more clear than the sentence you got, you got rid of, it stayed, right? So it wasn't Wikipedia with strangers coming in and flying by. You had right. to be in our circle and you earned trust because of your track record on previous stuff. So mm -hmm. Vivek, who lives more than 10,000 miles away, shows up and English is not his first language. And he says, how can I help? And he sees the list of articles that haven't been written yet. And he writes the first draft, six paragraphs long. And it's not very good. Not very good at all. And somebody, I don't know if it was me or not, rewrote it for him and said, hey, Vivek, look at this. And I was like, oh, you mean we're not trying to do this as fast as we can? Okay. And then the second one was twice as good as the first one. Sure. He ended up writing 18 articles. And by the last six, we couldn't make, a be couldn't make them better. That's great. And I will never meet Vivek. I have never met Vivek. I am grateful to Vivek. We danced together for months. And mm -hmm. then one day he said, I'm out. And we're like, great. Thank you for it. all the fish. And I think, where's Vivek now? Do you know? No idea. Wow. That's, that's too cool. Okay. I, um, I have one more question and then we'll turn it over. We've got a bunch of folks questions on LinkedIn. I know some folks wanted to ask, um, or actually I had, a, I had a, uh, just, just, a I wanted to offer a word, a humble submission to your word list. You make a word list of words that we should be using more often. How many times do we use these words? One word I wanted to submit to you for your consideration is wonder. Yeah. Wonder. It's a word that I feel, you know, in the boardroom, you know, I, I joke, don't wonder here. We don't want to know what you wonder, right? And yet nothing, the interesting stuff actually starts with wondering. Do you have any thoughts on that word in particular? Um, I'm going to put a little aside because I thought you meant it the other way. There are two mm. words that if you say you're going to do them, you can't. One is sulk and the other is a sense of wonder. Right? Mm. That if you're still looking out on the Grand Canyon or an Algonquin Park or something, you go, 
I feel a sense of wonder. It's just gone, right? It's gone, so right. that's what yeah. I thought you were going for because I'm in favor of wonder. But the yeah. other wonder is brilliant because yeah. the other wonder is like, is similar to saying, I have a feeling that. As yeah, opposed exactly. To, I am stating that. Yeah. It's I not a conclusion. It opens yeah. the door, it doesn't close them. Yeah. That's a, that's a nice way to say it. it opens the door. That's beautiful. All right, let's look at some folks. We won't be able to get to everybody, folks. I apologize in advance. One of my uh, one of the folks I admire most in the innovation space, Diego Rodriguez. Hi, Diego, if you're there. He asks, is there any aspect of Seth's book, Purple Cow, which you have rethought in, in the years since you published it? And Diego, I was reading Purple Cow just last night. So Seth, what do you think? Anything? Oh, so much of it. I would rewrite every one of my books if I had time, but then they wouldn't be markers in time. Uh, I think we've all been overwhelmed by the greedy, selfish, hustle, narcissism of so many people who once they got a microphone figured out how to sell something. Mm. And I went in, I dedicated the book to my late friend, Lionel Poulin, because of his craft, his commitment to it. I went in, telling a story to people who actually cared, telling a story to people who wanted to put their name on stuff. And if I was writing it again, there'd be a whole long chapter saying, if you are any of these people, please put this book down right now and right. walk away. The same way my heart was broken after permission marketing, because I assumed that people were going to approach this magical medium of email as the uh, asset it was, not as strip mining that they yeah. could use to like make a profit in the short run. Yeah. What if, if someone's wanting to qualify or disqualify themselves, put the book down, who, who should put the book down? You know, who would you, I think of the Royal Tenenbaums, like who'd you slap the book out of their hand of? <laughs> what are you looking for there? I think the two points are, if you want me to teach you why you stand on one foot, I politely decline. This is all learning is autodidactic. You have to learn through experience what you see. I'm just trying to help you see. And you can't, if you're here with, for the TLDR, taking notes about how you can turn around and use this in five minutes, I'm not interested. Hmm. And then the second thing is, which we talked about at the beginning, would we miss you if you were gone? And I got to tell you, you know, the publicists who send me an email every four minutes the spammers who send me an email every 30 seconds, the people who are trying to steal my credit card every 10 seconds. I wouldn't miss any of those people if they were gone. Yeah. Please don't pretend. If that's who you are, you should move on. Yeah. Thanks. That's great. Um, let's go to another question here. We've got one from Parker Gates, good friend in Nashville. He says, top of mind for me today is how to maintain the creative side of being a leader with the more operational side. What's the secret to maintaining a balance? Managers are very clear. They use power and authority to get people to do what they did yesterday, but faster and cheaper. We need them. No airlines, no fast food could exist if it weren't for managers. If you're trying to optimize the supply chain, you better have managers. But don't pretend to yourself or to your people that you are leading. Because leading is voluntary. It's exploring the liminal space between here and there. It's doing things that might not work. It's possible for a manager to lead, but you need to wear a different hat and you need to be very clear about which hat you're wearing. So what happened, for example, at Yahoo is as the company crossed 2,000 people, they got rid of anyone who was allowed to lead except for four people. Everyone else became a manager because they were milking so much money and the stock was going up $3 a yeah. day. That's yeah. going to, that you're fine, your career is done. But if you manage, you cannot manage your way to greatness. You can only manage your way to God. Mm. We should put that on a bumper sticker. Um, <laughs> that's that's a good one. Uh, the the last question, and then I know you've got it's pub day, so you've got I'm sure many things that you have to do. Um, and I'm again so grateful for the chance to talk with you today. I wanted to bring it back to Amazon, um, and the reason is because you didn't pull any punches, kind of um, in some of the data that you shared about Amazon. And for me, the thing that's interesting is, in many ways, they're an exemplar of innovation. And yet they're also uh, a cautionary tale about what to avoid. And you talk in the book about um, Amazon uh, turnover 
And I wonder, and yet you also mentioned that, that um, even in the carbon almanac, some turnover is good. So I wonder if you wanted to kind of elaborate a little bit on sure. what kind of turnover is good and what kind of turnover is troubling. Amazon used to be an exemplar of innovation. Now they're an exemplar of uh, profit seeking, cost cutting and stock price rising. And some of it has to do with Jeff leaving the building. When Jeff built the organization, he announced what the cost of acquiring a customer needed to be. And if you could beat that, you could do it any way that was ethical. So the number of experiments was huge. Then on the sales side, he said, we're going to be the store that sells everything, but we're never going to be good at selling anything. So people went to them with promotional ideas and stuff. They couldn't hear it because there wasn't a system in place for that. So as they built each new innovative entity, it began with who's it for? What's the change we seek to make? And there was a lot of innovation. And then as soon as they found something that they could locked down and cycle, it was about how do we cost reduce this. In yeah. terms, and I say this as the person who was the first independent outsider that they started a publishing company with. So I've been in the building. And so like, let's just look at the Kindle. When was the last time the Kindle was improved? It hasn't been improved since just shortly after it came out because they're just cost reducing. They're not saying, we have this magical device in millions of people's hands. Well, how can we make the software even more magical? They don't think mm. that way. But in terms of turnover, there's two kinds of turnover. The turnover in Amazon's warehouses, where according to what I just read, more than half of all the warehouse injuries in America happened last year in just one company's warehouses. Wow. That turnover cost them a third of their total profits in 2021. That Unreal. turnover isn't about enrollment. It's about people being exhausted and broken after just 90 days. That's not good because you created conditions that were unacceptable. They report internal documents say that there are some cities where they have run out of people to hire who haven't already worked at Amazon. They've like blown through everybody. That's different than the turnover that I would love to see in the Kindle group because there you're looking for people who are coming and saying, yeah, we got this, this baseline. What are the mm -hmm. things we can try here that haven't been tried yet? And there on the creative side, like, you know, today's pub day for Song of Significance, but it, there's going to be another 20 books published by Penguin tomorrow. They have turnover mm. all the time. That mm. leads to innovation when there are new authors. That's different than the, the tough stretch that Marvel and DC hit in the 70s and 80s because you had the same 20 writers writing the same comics over and over again. Right. I am... Um... I've got, as I said, I've got a couple more hours, so we'll book another time soon. Uh, sure. One one last question for you, just a fun one. Next month, we've got Kevin Kelly on the show. He's going to talk about his new book, Excellent uh, Advice. Um, I wondered if you could ask Kevin a question. What would, what would you want to ask Kevin? Kevin knows that I think he's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my entire life. I would ask him to explain, while talking slowly, what the book, what technology wants is about. And I would ask him to talk in detail about the walks he takes every year because the new book, which I helped uh, provoke by uh, sending him an email. Thank is, you for doing that, by the way. Is lovely and mm. people will enjoy it, but it will not change your life if you read it fast. Yeah, that I agree. It's like the Proverbs. You, you, can't, you can't just rush through the Proverbs, exactly. right? You need them to go through you. There needs to be a page a day calendar. So. Yeah. Part of the magic of Kevin Kelly is this human over his huge career has figured out how to distill beautiful insights, wisdom into things you can use, but only if you're willing to think about the stories behind it and take your time. I think about Kevin's work every single day. Mm. It's beautiful. I'll be sure to pass along the compliment and, uh, and send you what he says as well. Seth Godin, thank you so much for joining us. It's an incredible pleasure to have you here. Folks, if you haven't gotten it already, Seth's new book, The Song of Significance, is available today wherever you buy books. Support a local bookseller and, uh, and dive into this content. There's lots here that we didn't cover today, but it will be sure to amplify your contribution and your organization's contribution in the world. Until next time, everyone have a great day. Thank you. Make a ruckus. Thank you. Cheers.